Rebecca gave me another little nugget because we had one yesterday about her um, uh, causing the murder of some poor Christian boy. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you probably won't be surprised by this one. In high school, she skipped classes by carrying around a clipboard in the hallways and just looking like she was doing something official. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and she's changed her mind. Oh, she probably still wants to be a hoobit, but she says, if you can't be a hoobit, um, she'd like to be reincarnated as a care bear. Um, because she's always wanted a stomach tattoo and always wanted to destroy her enemies by staring at them. <laughs> Rebecca Watson. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susie. <laughs> yes, hello. You're probably all sick of me by now. This is my third oh. time on stage. No. Oh, you guys are such a good audience. I love you. Uh, yeah, it, you know, this is my third time up here, but it's very important that I uh, be here to uh, rebut uh, Vicky's vicious slandering <laughs> of social media. <laughs> uh, no, this is not a, a defense of all social media. I'm actually going to be, uh, well, uh, Helen gave me the perfect intro because she mentioned uh, the spread of myths online, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about, how myths spread, uh, whether or not uh, social media is ultimately a force for good or evil, uh, and uh, cat pictures, because um, I'm talking about social media, so it only seemed right to put in a bunch of pictures of my cats. This is Brendan Small, dressed as a fish. <laughs> he, he, loves, he loves his fish costume despite that look on his face. He did fall off that table shortly after this was taken. <laughs> if you've never put your cat in a sweater or something, you have to do it because they just really, they don't know what to do and they just sort of walk like this and then just tip over. It's, it's pretty great. So, uh, you know, it, we're a, a diverse audience, so uh, some of you may not know what I'm talking about when I talk about social media. So to get things started, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Social media is basically uh, a collection of different ways that we can all connect each other to each other, usually peer to peer, not uh, top down. And this can be via the internet. It can also be using mobile technology. There are, you know, the SGU is using uh, group chats to keep in, in touch with one another, uh, apps they put, they put on their phone because uh, they don't know how SIM cards work. Uh, so, so, uh, so that's, a, that's an example of social media. Uh, other examples, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, forums, fora, whatever you like, blogs, uh, chat rooms, and yeah, even uh, SMS messages. Um, and like I said, uh, the, uh, the thing about social media is that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not, there's not one authority source, uh, there's not, it's not the uh, 10 o'clock news or whatever telling you what's happening. It's your neighbor, it's your sister, it's your mother, it's your friend. Uh, and the other thing about social media is that there's just a tremendous amount of information out there that's being spread around on all of these different networks. And so this uh, allows us some interesting opportunities to crunch that data and see how exactly information spreads. Uh, and social media is really great for breaking news. Uh, I'll go into a few examples today, uh, but basically, uh, you don't have to wait until the 10 o'clock news. You know, you can find out information as it's happening just by going to Twitter. It's how I find out about breaking news, like when there's a uh, rioting somewhere or a natural disaster, things like that. Here's another picture of one of my cats. Uh, this is Fry wearing a pair of glasses I cut out of cardboard. That's all. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use social media to advance skepticism. This is a little complicated, so try to stay with me. Uh, first of all, you should be skeptical <laughs> while using social media. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, no, so please, save your questions for the end. <laughs> uh, and there's another picture of my cats. Ah, <laughs> oh, they're the best. Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, here's a, a funny thing, because a very similar quote was uh, just used by Helen. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting its shoes on. I see this quote all the time uh, attributed to, to Mark Twain. So when I was first making this presentation, I threw it in there because it's relevant to what I'm talking about. But then I tried to source the quote to make sure that Mark Twain said it. And uh, that's the interesting thing. I could not find a single place Mark Twain ever wrote anything like this. <laughs> he was a very clever man. He probably did say something along these lines. Um, but uh, I actually found instead all of these earlier uh, examples of similar quotes being used uh, much earlier. You know, some, you know, Jonathan Swift was the one that uh, Helen used. Uh, which disappointed me because it would have been a really great point for me to nail her on if she had used the Mark Twain version. <laughs> but you do have to love the irony, don't you, <laughs> of a quote that uh, talks about how easy it is to spread falsehoods. Uh, and so I always uh, get a little bit smugger every time I see someone use the Mark Twain quote. So I'm like, actually, mm. <laughs> Uh, but we do see that happen, especially on social media like Twitter. Uh, it does seem as though falsehoods can spread very, very quickly. For instance, uh, here is one Twitter user, Joe Santagato, who wrote, Wait, what? why is RIP Bill Nye the science guy trending? No way, man. I loved Bill Nye. He was the only good part of science class. This was retweeted 3,626 times and favorited more than 600 times. If you're not familiar with Twitter, this means that uh, for more than 3,000 times, uh, someone saw that tweet and then clicked a little button that took that tweet and then sent it to everybody that follows them on Twitter. So it's a way of quickly passing along information. And favoriting is just a way that people show that they like a thing. So this got shared far and wide, despite the fact that Bill Nye was not dead back then, nor is he dead now. Uh, thank goodness, national treasure. Uh, but yeah, it, this, this spread uh, very far before anybody uh, got a chance to say Bill Nye is still alive. And it's not just Bill Nye, although it's happened to Bill Nye three times <laughs> so far that I could count. He's died three times on Twitter. Um, and he's not the only one. Bill Cosby has died at least four times. Uh, unfortunately, not true. Uh, <laughs> Still, still kicking. Uh, Reese Witherspoon was stabbed on Twitter in, in August 2012. Uh, that was probably related to the joke of uh, that actress, uh, Reese, what's her name, was stabbed. And the person says, Witherspoon? And you say, no, with a knife. <laughs> I'm guessing that someone heard that and ran to Twitter and was like, Reese Witherspoon was stabbed to death. So that got past her. That joke went over way better than I thought it would. <laughs> you guys are way too nice of an audience. <laughs> All right, one more time. Uh, Eddie Murphy was killed in a Swiss snowboarding accident in 2010 on Twitter. Uh, still alive. Uh, Denzel Washington was killed in a Swiss snowboarding accident <laughs> in 2012 on Twitter. Adam Sandler was killed in a Swiss snowboarding accident <laughs> also in 2012. And when I was looking into the, these, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I see a pattern. <laughs> so I looked into it, and it turns out there's this comedy website where you can go and plug in any name you want, and it'll mock up this article showing that person died in a Swiss snowboarding accident. <laughs> so this, this one gets around every, every now and again. Uh, so yeah, we know that uh, lies can spread very quickly on Twitter. What are the results of that? Well, a couple of years ago, Google uh, changed the way they showed search results so that on the first page of your Google results, instead of just showing blog posts and news sources and web pages, they showed you a special little section that was your social media uh, stuff, like things that they thought would be interesting to you that came from Twitter and, and Facebook and other uh, social media outlets. And some researchers thought that was very interesting, and they wanted to see, uh, they wanted to track how that was affecting uh, people who were searching for certain uh, 
real time and important events. So in particular, they looked at a Senate race in Massachusetts between Martha Coakley and Scott Brown, uh, Martha Coakley being the incumbent who was favored to win the race and was winning in all of the polls up until the very last second, at which point uh, these researchers noticed this huge uh, upswing in the number of tweets in favor of Scott Brown, but, but particularly tweets that were all linking to uh, one website that was meant to smear Martha Coakley. Uh, sometimes with maybe not, you know, tr truthy sort of smears. Um, later it turned out this website was created by the same people who were behind the Swift Boat campaign. I'm not sure if that made it out here, but that was uh, something that basically decided a presidential election in favor of the Republican candidate uh, by using uh, truthy sort of lies. And uh, so what Google found, or what uh, these researchers found, excuse me, was that um, a huge number of accounts were all created within a few minutes of one another, all followed each other, and all began retweeting the same links back to this website in the final moments of this campaign. And if you were to go on Google during that time and search for either Martha Coakley or Scott Brown, uh, that's what you saw at the top were links to this smear website. And the amazing thing is it worked. Uh, Scott Brown pulled ahead and eked out a win. Um, and that's what these uh, researchers concluded was that by uh, Google showing social media results, they were uh, providing a larger platform for uh, personal opinions, uh, half-truths, sometimes outright lies, that uh, would normally be restricted just to people who were following those accounts, but instead it's taking those and displaying them to anybody who happens to be searching for, in this instance, Martha Coakley. Uh, so that was quite disturbing. Um, but it, they used a really interesting technique that was uh, later used by several other organizations. This comes from uh, an aptly named application called Truthy. You can find it at truthy.indiana.edu. And this is a way of visualizing Twitter interactions. It's pretty cool. Uh, what you're seeing is a conversation between Lady Gaga and Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> as it happens. Uh, <laughs> Stay with me. Uh, <laughs> orange lines are replies to tweets. Uh, so uh, at the top, that's Lady Gaga, that dot in the middle that looks like a, the center of a, the dandelion. And at the bottom, that's Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, the orange line connecting them is them speaking to one another. Blue lines represent retweets, so people taking what Lady Gaga said and retweeting it to all of their followers and then on and on. And then, uh, you know, people doing the same for Donald Rumsfeld. Obviously, Lady Gaga is a bit more popular. Um, but yeah, this is what a real interaction looks like when you use this type of visualization. But now I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like with those uh, anti-Martha Coakley Twitter accounts. It looks like this. <laughs> So again, the blue lines are retweets, orange lines are replies. So there are no orange lines. <laughs> Nobody is actually talking to each other. There's just one tweet put out and then a bunch of accounts all retweeting it within one little bunch. Uh, nothing quite gets out. But what happened with that Google thing is it took this, you know, this uh, fabricated, engineered sort of social interaction and it showed it to a larger audience uh, because Google was tricked into believing that this was a real interaction between real humans, when in fact it was some bots set up by a marketing company hoping to get a political candidate elected. So we do know that lies travel quickly, that you can game the system. What happens when the truth uh, tries to catch up? Here's one visualization of that uh, back in 2011 during the Occupy Wall Street protests in New York. NBC News uh, on Twitter reported breaking news that uh, something along the lines of police uh, closing off airspace over the Occupy protests. And that top tweet you see, the, the pale green line, the one that goes a bit higher, that was the initial tweet reporting this. It was uh, shared. Uh, you can see how many times it was shared along uh, the axis there, uh, a little more than 200 uh, times 
every 10 minutes. Um, it turns out that that was incorrect information. The police replied to that tweet and said, we have not closed off airspace, we don't do that. And so uh, a short time later, uh, less than half an hour later, NBC News issued a correction. And that's the second line you see, that blue line. So you can literally see the truth trying to catch up to the lie and not doing the best job of it. Uh, this uh, was done by a researcher uh, who looked at several cases. He, he reported that, yes, sometimes the truth does catch up and even overtake the lies, but this is far more often the case, unfortunately. So that's a little depressing, but now I'll tell you about some more research that might brighten your day a bit more as skeptics. So uh, back in 2010, some researchers studied uh, social media use following uh, the Chilean earthquake. And so this is the perfect way to, uh, the perfect time to study social media because as I said, social media is great for breaking news. And in a large scale disaster, uh, breaking news and accurate news can mean the difference between life and death. Uh, what buildings are falling down? Uh, what water is contaminated? Uh, where can people find shelter? Where can they find food? And so these researchers looked at several uh, memes, several uh, factoids or facts that made it around uh, in the uh, days following the earthquake. And they picked uh, some that had since been confirmed to be absolutely true and others that had been confirmed to be false. So uh, for instance, true, uh, there was an aircraft with six people that crashed near Concepcion. Uh, there was looting of a supermarket, a tsunami in certain towns. False rumors are things like uh, a large water tower broke, uh, a, a different city's tsunami warning. And what they were looking at specifically was, uh, for each of these, how many times did people retweet them? Uh, how many times did people affirm that they were true? You know, see a tweet, maybe retweet it, and, and also add, yes, I know this happened, uh, something like that. Uh, how many people denied it, so retweeted and said, I know that this is false? And how many people questioned it? Uh, so maybe replying to the original person and saying, are you sure? And what they found uh, is uh, not depressing at all. Um, what they found was that the things that were later confirmed to be true were much less likely to be questioned, much less likely to be denied, and much more likely to be affirmed compared to the things that were false. The false rumors were much more likely to be questioned and much more likely to be denied. Uh, and, and less likely to be retweeted in general. So there we have an instance on a large scale of people collectively coming together and being skeptical, and being skeptical on social media in a way that can help save people's lives. Uh, people could generally go on Twitter and you know, if they're dealing with the after effects of this earthquake, they can be reasonably sure that they're getting accurate information. So to go back to that Bill Nye death tweet, if we look at the top replies to this guy, you can see that they are, for the most part, questioning him or telling him that it's a lie or telling him that he's super attractive. Because <laughs> he's wearing like a muscle shirt. He looks pretty good. Uh, so yeah, what, what you have is a lot of people were, were retweeting this, but a lot of people are saying, no, that's not right. We're saying, is that right? Are you sure? Uh, that's skepticism in action. Uh, this happened, uh, this is funny, I, I only just noticed this, I had this guy blocked. <laughs> um, so you can probably guess where this is leading. But uh, <laughs> this is a guy who uh, was tweeting during, the, uh, during Hurricane Sandy, which hit New York uh, uh, in 2012, and was quite devastating. So again, you have a natural disaster, something where breaking news uh, is really important and can affect people's lives and comfortably smug within 24 hours or so became one of the top tweeters. He uh, claimed to be on the ground in New York reporting on, uh, you know, in this case, uh, the electric company shutting down all the power in Manhattan, uh, reporting that certain subway stations were flooded, things like that. Uh, the problem is that uh, they were all lies. Uh, for some reason, this guy just went on and just was making up utter lies. So at first these things were being retweeted, 
But this all happened within a few hours. People started calling him on his bullshit and, uh, and basically debunking his tweets. And within 24 hours, uh, he, his, his real name had been revealed. Uh, it turns out he's this, uh, you, you might expect a person like this, like a Twitter troll, to be some 14-year-old you know, kid in his parents' basement. No, he's an extremely wealthy Republican donor, actually, uh, which made it all really awkward. Just imagine this super wealthy guy sitting around in his tie telling lies on Twitter for fun. Um, but he was exposed and eventually fired, uh, like all within 24 hours, uh, and his account was banned. So again, there we have someone attempting to use social media to spread misinformation, but skeptics on Twitter turned it around, exposed him, and got him kicked off before he had a chance to do any damage. Now that hurricane provided a lot of fun things to debunk <laughs> running around social media. Uh, that big picture of the Statue of Liberty was one of my favorites. Uh, does anybody know what that's actually from? Day After Tomorrow, yeah. Love that movie. I unabashedly, unironically love that movie. Um, so yeah, somebody took a screenshot from, from that movie through the NY1 live cam thing over it and tried to pass it off. But again, people smacked it down. Um, the nice thing is that uh, there are websites you can go to that are specifically set up to take uh, photos uh, that you see on social media and tell you whether or not they're true. Uh, and actually, uh, there, during the hurricane, there were several mainstream sites that were doing this as well. But there are other sites that are set up specifically for this purpose. Uh, and just real quick, the, my other favorite one is uh, in the bottom corner, that shark thing, which does come from a real photo, like a really impressive photo. But then it gets photoshopped every time any city anywhere floods. You will see that photo as proof there are sharks in the streets, you know. Uh, but here's a, a great site, is Twitter wrong? Simple, <laughs> easy. Uh, I love this guy. He takes uh, you know, mostly photos that you see passed around on social media and tells you whether or not they are true or false. So here's one from at mind blowing fact, uh, saying this is how India looks like from outer space on Diwali night. Happy Diwali to the entire world. Uh, it's not. Uh, that, that's not what that is. That's actually, a, it's an impressive photo, but it's a composite of several different photos showing uh, lights all over India from separate times. Um, but I really like uh, what this guy, uh, the guy who runs his Twitter wrong, uh, had to say about this. As a general rule, if you see a Twitter account called Mind Blowing Facts, it's probably fairly safe to mentally substitute the words deluge of bollocks <laughs> in place of the name. <laughs> and that's Tom Phillips, he's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, there are people doing that. Uh, there are also social media sites that have tried uh, myth busting on their own. Uh, Weibo is the uh, Chinese Twitter slash Facebook. Um, it's, you know, all those things in one. It's very, very popular. And Weibo instituted a really kind of interesting thing a little while ago, a few years back. Um, it's a reputation score. And the idea is that you start with a certain average reputation score, and you can increase it by, say, using your real name on the site and proving that it's you. And you can lose reputation points by, say, lying about things, like trying to spread misinformation. So it's a cool idea, because then people can see your reputation score. Um, but it brings up all these other problems, like, how do you even monitor you know, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands peop of people using your service? Uh, how do you engage that many fact checkers on that much stuff? It's really difficult, if not impossible, to do that on a large scale top down um, without just doing some sort of blanket censorship thing. Um, I don't speak Chinese, so I can't tell you. I actually asked some of the people uh, when I was in Hong Kong a few weeks ago, if Weibo still does this thing, but nobody could tell me. So I, don't, I wish I had more information for you. But uh, it seems, though, that the, the best way, uh, while, you know, after looking at all these studies, the best way to uh, keep people honest online is to simply be openly skeptical. You know, use your brain, and if you see something that you think is false or misleading, to speak up about it, to question it, to deny it if it turns out to be not true at all. 
Uh, so here are a few tips on how to fact check while on social media. Uh, number one is asking, is it too good to be true? Uh, is uh, there actually a shark going around eating hipsters in Brooklyn? <laughs> as fantastic as that would be, <laughs> uh, probably not. Best to double check it. Uh, another thing to do is to figure out if the user who started this, who initially posts the content, uh, if they have a real name, or if, they don't, or if they're not using their real name, are they using a pseudonym that has a history? It's one of the cool things about the internet is that you don't have to use your real name to still have uh, a reputation that follows you from site to site. So, uh, you know, if, is this just an anonymous person on 4chan, for instance, or is this someone on Twitter who's verified and using their real name? Uh, it's uh, fair, t I think, to be a bit more skeptical of people who are using pseudonyms uh, that don't have a history uh, or who are completely anonymous. Uh, can you contact these people? Uh, that's one of the nice things, if they are using their real name. Uh, is there some way to shoot them an email or just uh, at reply them on Twitter. Um, you'd be surprised at how often a troll's uh, facade can crumble the second you try engaging with them. They're usually not smart enough <laughs> to be able to keep up lies uh, for long when you pepper them with, with direct questions. Uh, and when it comes to photos, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff you can do. One thing to do is looking at landmarks in the photos and cross-reference it with satellite imagery. We live in the future. Uh, you can literally go online and see you know, an area, what it looks like on a satellite. Um, and this has been a way that several sites have debunked some of the more popular, pernicious, uh, and impressive photos that get around on social media, especially when large disasters happen in major cities and people are photoshopping sharks into them, for instance. Uh, you know, if it's a, a major city, you might actually be able to talk to someone who lives there to say, you know, well, can you see that building if you're standing over here, if the camera is here? Uh, you'd be surprised at how often uh, some photos get debunked that way. Uh, other fun ways to investigate photos, uh, there are several different tools. I'm going to go over a few of them. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that a little bit of information can kill. <laughs> Uh, it's the most dangerous thing. So I'm going to tell you about a few tools. They're not going to turn you into the Sherlock Holmes of <laughs> social media. Uh, you know, they don't always work. Uh, this is more just a fun look at some of the ways you can tell if an image has been doctored. Um, but there are other ways. There are people who are much better at doctoring photos than you probably are at uncovering them. Uh, but here we go. Here are a few of them. Uh, so one is TinEye, and also Google does this now, reverse image search. Uh, so for instance, that Statue of Liberty uh, photo, you take that, you stick it into TinEye, it's a free service, and it will tell you uh, the earlier uh, references to that image online. And you can go back in time and basically see the first time it was uploaded. In this case, you could clearly see that this was originally uploaded long before a hurricane ever hit New York. Uh, another thing is a picture of my cat, <laughs> again, but this time for a purpose. Uh, there is a, um, there's a, there are several tools you can get online uh, for free that will allow you to look at uh, XIF data, E-X-I-F data. And uh, this is something that uh, you, I, it, it took me a long time to realize that my camera was doing this, but when you take a digital photo, your camera, whichever you're using, especially if you're using like an iPhone or something, puts a load of data into that photo that you can later see. So in this case, uh, you can tell that I took that photo of my cat with an iPad 2. Uh, you can tell uh, what the focal length was. You can tell I didn't use flash. Uh, you can see the original image size. But if you are taking photos with an iPhone that's uh, got your data turned on, then you might also see where you were when you took it. Uh, little things like that. So by putting images, when you put images up online, you might be surprised at how much data you're actually putting out there. 
So that's a fun thing to play with anyway, even if you're not out there debunking photos. Uh, download a program that will show you this data and take a few pictures of your with your iPhone or what have you and, and see what sort of data there is on your pictures. Um, but this is also a good way to uh, bust somebody who <laughs> might have, um, you know, might be lying about where they took a photo or when they took a photo, for instance. Uh, so here's the same picture of my cat to illustrate another fun tool. Uh, there's a cool thing called image error analysis. And this is another free tool you can find online if you Google that. Um, and what it does is basically every time you save an image, you lose a little bit of data. And so image error analysis will uh, examine the pixels in a picture and it will show you spots where uh, the image is more degraded than elsewhere in the image uh, because maybe that part has been saved more often. So uh, for instance, if I, if I put this uh, undoctored photo into image error analysis, uh, you, know, you can kind of see outlines of things in the photo, but nothing really pops out. But now I will show you a photoshopped image of a frog and some coins. And when you put that in, you see really bright spots where those coins are because those coins were added to the photo after it was saved. Uh, you can also see uh, this frog has had some work done on his eyes. Uh, so uh, yeah, and, and maybe a little to his body as well. Uh, so here's the original photo. Uh, so yeah, you can see the little bits that were done. It's not a perfect thing. Um, this actually isn't the original photo. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> so you can see, it's kind of hard to tell. Oh, hypnotoad. <laughs> Always good for a laugh. Uh, here's a fun image from Victoria's Secret. Uh, when put into image error analysis, uh, you, you can, it was originally noted online because it was obviously Photoshop because this woman is holding on to a bag handle. <laughs> and as far as I know, Victoria's Secret does not sell bag handles. <laughs> So yeah, basically, but what was interesting is that when you put it into image error analysis, you might have expected to see the outline of a bag that was cut out. No, she was cut out <laughs> and then entirely pasted on a new image. Um, so that whole background is probably not where this woman was shot. Uh, her teeth have been brightened, her eyes have been widened, and uh, her entire dress is uh, all lit up because when you go online to Victoria's Secret, you can choose to see the dress in different colors. So the color of the dress is completely photoshopped. So yeah, that's a little fun thing you can try sometime. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about are videos, uh, because sometimes people uh, have great success doing viral videos, and usually these are things that are related to the paranormal. Uh, so, uh, this is a fun thing that was going around a few years ago um, where people were uploading uh, videos from around the world that seemed to show um, a weird sound happening, uh, like a really creepy sound that sounded like it could be uh, angels announcing the end of the world sort of thing. Um, let's see if... Uh, video will work. This is always a... Can yeah. anyone else hear that noise? Listen. What the hell is that? Hey, hey, what's that? So, uh, that was one example, and it was kind of creepy, right? Creepy sound in the background. This was shot in Melbourne. And uh, what's interesting is that there is a way that you can sometimes tell if someone has shot a video or recorded a sound and then pasted another sound on top of it. And this is a fun trick you can try at home. Uh, and uh, you do this by, uh, so, Imagine uh, an audio file and you see the wavelengths, right, of, of your noise. Um, there are two different ways, basically, to, that you can record sound. Uh, one of them is called mono. So in mono, uh, your left and your right ears hear exactly the same thing. 
so if I were to um, record something while you walk past me, it would not sound like it's traveling from one ear to the other. It would sound exactly the same in both ears. So you've got uh, one wavelength that's being broadcast to both ears. The other way is stereo. Stereo is, you know, you're, if you're listening and it sounds like a, a car is traveling from right to left. Those are, th those are two different waveforms, one being played to your left ear and one being played to your right ear. With me so far? Okay. Uh, so, one way to uh, tell if somebody's been fiddling with some sound but who doesn't necessarily know what they're doing is if somebody has taken uh, sound from a, a stereo recording and combined it with mono recording. Because often uh, your shitty digital camera might just record in mono, for instance. And uh, so it'd be cool if you could somehow separate things that were in mono from things that were recorded in stereo, even when they're together in one video. Well, you can. Uh, you can do that by taking the waveform and reversing it and then pasting it back on top. So uh, if you've got one peak going up like this, basically, you reverse it. So now it's a peak going down like this, and that sounds like silence. Those cancel each other out. So uh, when you do this, Anything that was recorded in mono will be canceled out, will be completely silent, and you'll be left with anything that was recorded in stereo. So here is the exact same video with that little trick done to it. Weird. <laughs> His voice has mysteriously disappeared from this track. That's because he took that creepy sound and just pasted it over top of whatever he was filming. So if you want to play the uh, first one again. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Can anyone else hear that noise? So that's the original. Listen. And that's the... And it's called center pan removal. You can look it up if you want more tips on how to do it. It doesn't always work. Sometimes people uh, record things both in mono or both in stereo, so uh, it won't work. But when it does work, it's so fun. So this is another one. This supposedly came from Chicago. It was also uh, over a video. Uh, I tried to do the same thing, but found that it was just that sound. I'll play it again. Oh, no. No. There you go. So, it's a different sound than the Melbourne one, but this was in Chicago. Here's another one I found in Kiev. Come on. Maybe. <laughs> you know, at least get rid of that, like, very obvious screech in the background. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I couldn't do the center pan removal on those, but, you know, when you're hearing the exact same sound, uh, you know, if it's the exact same sound in the sky, that's creepy. If it's the exact same sound, including birds, suddenly it's not so creepy. So, yeah, it turned out that, you know, this thing that was looking like a worldwide phenomenon was just a bunch of people fucking with people. <laughs> uh, there, there were a lot of people wondering if this was like a a marketing stunt or something like that from a film company because some of the uh, videos were really creepy and stuff. But no, it's just humans. <laughs> just humans gathering together to be jerks to each other. <laughs> and uh, I think that I never uh, was able to um, definitely nail this down. Like a lot of the sounds came from different things. Some seem to be like slowed down musical instruments and things like that. Uh, but the, the most common ones seem to have come from the Kevin Smith film, Red State. Uh, if you've ever seen that, I don't want to spoil it for you, even though it's old and not very good. Uh, <laughs> but there's a bit of an apocalyptic sort of sound in that, and it seems like people just swiped it and used it on their videos. All right. So, uh, why should you bother using social media to advance Skepticism. This is the point where I'm going to get Vicky to sign up for a Twitter account. It's going to happen. 
<laughs> All right, maybe not. Uh, but you do it because that's how it works. You know, that's the best thing we've found to, for, for myth busting online is for you to help. <laughs> Everybody banding together and crowdsourcing uh, fact checking. And it actually works surprisingly well, as several studies have shown. Uh, and also, there's a, another picture of my cats. Uh, so that's all I've got. Thank you so much, everyone.